First chance to sit down with Coach Gundy as we get ready for the start of the season. Oklahoma State and Central Michigan at Boone Pickens Stadium coming off 12 wins and a Fiesta Bowl and many, many memorable moments. I was thinking about this, Coach. You know, you, we have COVID. We have a lot of changes in college football, transfer portal, NIL, all of that. But yet, things look like Oklahoma State football is in a really good place. How do you think you've been able to come through at least initially a lot of change and be in a pretty favorable spot, ranked in the top 15 in the country? Well, we're in a great position, and we navigated through it. Uh, administration, a lot of people that were involved in it. Um, <clears throat> we made good decisions at, at very critical times. When you look back to where we were in 2020 sitting here, we didn't know if we were even going to play. Nobody mm -hmm. in the country knew if they were going to play. Young people were, weren't really wanting to practice. There was a lot of concern about the virus we, didn't, we weren't aware of. Our culture helped us a lot. So we were able to get quality work out of our players, buy into them on what they were concerned about, what they weren't concerned about. You know, in that year, the 2020 year, we had a shortened season. See, we didn't play the, uh, the other games, home games. Right, right, right. We were basically a 10-win season. Mm -hmm. uh, we just didn't have the other two games to play at home. So there was a good chance we'd have won those two games. Then you come back last year, there was still some lingering effect. And then you had, uh, we had the portal, all the talk of the NIL, players changing teams, what the rules were going to be. And there was still some uncertainty across the country in a lot of things. So it affected young people. And then we rolled into the NIL this season, which has become a big issue. Um, good or bad, whatever way you look at it, right, it's, right. It's, it's an issue because it has to be discussed. And I don't think anybody in the country really has all the answers yet in, in how to handle NIL. Uh, and then players move around with the portal. So we're in um, uncharted waters, and there's no doubt. But I go back to our culture. We just kind of stayed the course. Uh, we're letting things play out, uh, communicating with our players, but not changing really who we are and what we do to get what we need to get accomplished, which is some team chemistry to get guys ready to go play hard on Saturdays. Yeah, it's interesting because at a time where you, the thought would be things are volatile, right? Things are changing. There's so much going on. That's never been what your program has been about, right. certainly in the last, last 10 years. So it would seem like your program is built to sort of just deal with whatever comes up because that's always been the thought. I mean, it's always been the prevailing mindset. It's, it, it, it seems like in a lot of ways your program is just sort of built to deal with this, whatever that might be. A lot of trial and error, yeah. a lot of mistakes. And those of us that are getting older in our life, we realize that we make lots of mistakes. And then I think it's important you learn from your mistakes. So I'm in year 18, made a lot of mistakes in a lot of areas. And when these things hit a couple years ago, I was seasoned and in a position to where we and or I could stay calm and make really good decisions based on what we were hit with. I would not want to be a young coach trying to get started in this profession with everything going on right now mm -hmm. because there's so much uncertainty. That I'm, I'm not comfortable with uncertainty. But we faced some of it, but there was a lot of experience. The majority of the people that work in our football building, in all areas, not just coaches, have been with me a long time. So they kind of know what I expect. And one thing that I've instilled in them is don't flinch and don't panic. Just let the thing play out. Because the players, the young people, they don't know. They're just looking at us. If we don't panic, they're not going to panic. If we panic, they're going to panic. So we learned to just let it play out, make good quality decisions. We had to adjust. I can't imagine that the most successful coaches in college football that have been doing this a long time haven't had to adjust considerably over the last 18 to 24 months. Yeah. If you don't adjust with what's going on, you got to get out of the game, in my opinion. So we've been very flexible. We've made adjustments. But then we haven't changed our core system, which you're talking about. When we train in the weight room, our off-season, our accountability, our discipline, our structure, our practice habits, that hasn't changed. 
but we've had to make some changes on the outside, which that's just the way the world is. So you're talking about not panicking and staying the course. Mm -hmm. So what would the best piece of advice that 2022 Coach Mike Gundy would give 2005 Coach Mike Gundy? If you could could rewind it and say, okay, let me just tell you this, what would it be? Well, I've said many times that I wasn't smart enough and I didn't take enough time to sit down and realize how difficult this job was or I might not have made it. All I did was go full speed. And in doing that, I didn't have much patience. My patience was non-existent. With coaches, with players, with administrative support, whoever it may be, that's a mistake. So I didn't take my mom's advice <laughs> when she said, Michael, you need to slow down. You're, you're, you're out of control. You're moving too fast. You're impatient you're angry, this is going to affect you as a coach. I I didn't really listen. I just thought that she was a nice lady and didn't understand. (laughs) Now that she's passed and you look back, as we get older, we look back at our parents. uh, And now I I still have my dad around, and he tells me all the time. But I wish I would have listened to her and been more patient because she was right. When you deal with a large group of people, like we have 127 players, and then a staff of just under 100, give or take, in this building. So you add those numbers up, really you're just a little bit under 250. We have a lot of different egos, a lot of different personalities, a lot of different people. If we don't have, or if I don't have patience with the, with the operation, it doesn't go as smooth. So the answer to the question would be just patience, just relax and let things take care of itself. Interesting. What's the best hidden characteristic of this team? as you enter the season? Something that may not be obvious that's going to matter. You and I were talking off the air. I think this team is creating an, an identity earlier than what other teams have. Okay. I mean, in every year, based on the leaders, based on the production level, a lot of other things, each team creates an identity. And that's who this team is. That's who they will be. I can't really control that. It's based on those guys. It's going to be based on Tyler Lacey. It's going to be based on JT. It's going to be based on Colin Oliver. It's going to be based on Spencer, okay, Brennan Presley, so on and so forth. And it seems like that this team is really close, and they've started to create a little bit of an identity, when in most cases I can give you an update on that around the 1st of October. But maybe we'll know in a couple weeks. If that is true, and it's the identity that they need to work to be productive, then this team will be just fine. How do you feel about your running backs? Good. Uh, I like uh, what Dominic's done in practice. I like the guys behind him that haven't played any. So we talk about this every year. We have good young players across the board. But a good young player is not going to give me as much in the first three, four, five, six games of the year as a veteran player, even if he's more talented. You just don't do it yeah. long term. I mean, young players that get on the field, their heart's beating out of their chest. They're sweating. So we instill and give them good quality information. But when that's taking place, you don't think like you should. Your focus is limited, so you can't be as productive. Every once in a while, you run into a Colin Oliver who really never lost focus last year. Very rare. Most of the time – those young players um, run into that issue. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. What's maybe the one thing about Central Michigan that gives you the most concern? I think their coaches instill toughness in their team. I think that they practice like we practice. I think that they're going to try to hang their hat on being physical up front on both sides of the ball. We believe in that here. I've I've hung my hat on that here for for 18 years. And I think that football is a game where tough teams win in most cases. And so when I watched them last year, and I just look back at his history and um, the way they practice from what I hear is they're trying to instill toughness in their front guys. That's a concern for me. All right, let's take a little random path here. Time for our old trapper, old-fashioned beef jerky. What's your beef? This is not really a beef. It's something you've talked about in the offseason. I'm interested to see what you think. 
as we get closer, obviously, to the actual start of the season, do you still feel like in the Big 12 we're going to see teams playing a little faster? Are we going to sort of retro back to 2010, 2011 when more spread playing faster? Do you, do you see that still coming down the pike? Yes. Um, tech. I think Tech's going to do it. I think TCU's going to do it. Um, I've heard that Kansas State is doing it. Um, Oklahoma's going to do it. So unless I'm way off, we're going to circle right back to where we were in those years. Yeah. Uh, with a, we might get into some 85, 100 play a game for the defenses in this league during conference play. That's What's Your Beef brought to you by Old Trapper. Hey, don't be fooled. Not all beef jerky is the same. In fact, there are big differences in quality from one brand to the next. And with Old Trapper, they have the quality you can see in their iconic clear view packages. As you can see right here, you can see the quality on your screen. Old Trapper, sponsor of What's Your Beef. Coach Gundy and I have our little play breakdown when we return. Stay with us. Old Trapper Beefs, last bag. You know there's plenty for both of you. Old Trapper, what's your beef? The official beef jerky of the Big 12. At OG&E, we energize our future every day. That means enhancing and improving our grid to shorten outages, increasing reliability, and maintaining rates that are 30% below the national average as our communities continue to grow and flourish. There's a lot that goes into delivering affordable, reliable power. We do it so you're in control of your future. Because at OG&E, we energize life. Decorative towel. Alan. There was a mess. I wiped up a mess. Yeah, you. Where is the bu? Never mind. I found it. The right side. And a touchdown. When game day is a go, there's a Bud Light there. We'll make this simple. It's time to go and get rewarded for it. Save up to 25 cents per gallon of gas with the MyPhillips 66 app. That's right, up to 25 cents per gallon of gas. That means for every fill-up, you're saving money for your next adventure. That's a reward that keeps on going. The app is safe and secure. Plus, mobile pay offers fewer touch points during payment, so you can focus on going and saving. Download and start saving with the MyPhillips 66 app, so you can save more to go more. Phillips 66, live to the full. We continue with Coach Gundy and something a little different this year. And as we get into the season, we'll be breaking down plays in the previous game and throughout the season. It'll be a lot of fun. Coach will have control of the remote, which is a good thing, as it should be, to sort of walk us through what's happening. And, Coach, we'll just get started. We go back to the Fiesta Bowl, the win over Notre Dame, which was so much fun. Another one of your iconic comebacks and a lot of memorable plays in this game, made by a lot of your key players. Let's take yeah, a look. Yeah, um, it's uh, – it was uh, obviously a, a huge game for, for Oklahoma State. And um, we're in a, a little uh, um, fake inside zone, flip to the receiver, uh, outside sweep concept, where, as you can see, this guy we're trying to trick, number 24, mm -hmm. and he buys into the inside fake. They actually played it pretty good if you watch number two for Notre Dame. He came down. But we all know this, tackling a, a, t tackling a skill player in space is extremely difficult, and that's what happens to him here. He's trying to get down a good player. Uh, Bray makes a move there, um, spins, gets in, uh, gets in the end zone, gets a big touchdown. Uh, pretty good play for a freshman. Oh, no question. Big play in a key situation. See him break the tackle, slip into the end zone, part of the comeback there. You know, and, and as you saw, obviously, you know, for lack of a better term, the eyes violated, number 24 you're talking about. Eyes are violated. Sure. Am, I, am I describing that correctly? And next thing you know, there he goes. It is. It's, it, it's so difficult um, that at this level, there's, if you just watch from this angle, and I'll slow it down here. Okay. If you just look from this angle at all the things going on, see the, the, the three eligible uh, backs, 87 could potentially touch the ball, mm -hmm. 
85 could touch the ball, seven could touch the ball, and the quarterback. So really, four people could touch the ball. So if you just image me and these guys, and I'll play it slow, just look at what's happening in front of your face. So, wow. So how do you know where to go? Just watch and say, yeah, him going by, that guy's going that way, he's going that way, and the quarterback's going that way. It's really option football, isn't it? Mm-hmm, sure. When it's all said and done, I mean, that yeah. looks like looks like it, it's a flip pass concept, but look, yeah. might as well be the wishbone, right? It's right. the same concept, right? Everybody going different directions, so keeps linebackers from coming downhill. Very good. Let's jump ahead. So defensively, we're in a three-man rush, and – um, we just get unbelievable effort right here from Brock Martin. If you look at him, he's pushing. Look how big the guy is he's playing against, right? I'm going to say 6'8", 320. And Brock gets his left hand under his shoulder pads. He lifts him. He's trying to get to an eight-yard spot. And what we mean by that is this. Look where the quarterback is. Okay. <clears throat> he's at five. And then he's going to go to six, seven, right around eight. So these guys, these ends need to take a path the shortest distance between two points to eight yards deep, eight to eight and a half. And that's the path that Brock's on right here. He's going to bend now to that eight and a half. His back foot's at about eight. He's going to bend right now and try to drive that guy into that guy. Same thing was going on over here with Lacey, except he slipped. Look how big these two guys are. Yeah, huge. That was one of the issues we had. But look at at him get up. Lacey, or uh, that's Colin. I think that's Colin. Yeah, that's yeah, Colin. Colin. Yeah, so Colin's the guy Colin's that fell. Doing. But watch Brock lift, and he's going to push him back in and gives great effort. Unbelievable. And that's I mean, his wrestling background, isn't it? Yeah, to be able it to is. twist and I turn mean, off balance like that? Yeah, I mean, if you just stop it and look where he's at right now, okay, this guy is holding his shoulder pad, which is what they do. His back is to the quarterback, and he knows he's there, and watch his right arm as he reaches around because he knows he's behind him, watch his right arm and makes a play. It's big time. Yeah. At a crucial time in the game. Sure. It's just it, you, you see that particular play, and that to me is almost like the classic example of how Brock Martin plays. That's mm-hmm. who he is. Is that a reasonable statement? 100%. I mean, these two guys in a wrestling match would be hard. I, I'm, I'm 320. I'm, I'm 240. Right, I'm 6'2", and I'm 6'8". So they're having a wrestling match to get to the quarterback and the 240-pounder won. Wow. Now, the the last thing here for the fans at home. Mm -hmm. So you see Tyler Lacey, he's going to try to get pushed back in the quarterback, but he's also going to be aware of the quarterback taking off. So if you watch what he's doing, see how he's got – see him peeking? So if the quarterback were to take off and go this way, he's got to come off and make that play. And that's why, you know, Lacey, people think of him as a defensive end in certain packages. He obviously fits more inside because he has that agility. extra responsibility and agility to make that play if need right. be versus a bigger yeah. traditional inside guy. Yeah, and so the two outside guys can cut it loose, and then the, the middle guy needs to be a protector. Easy enough. All right, now you're in hurry up late in the first half. Okay, so we're down 21. We're, we're, we're running hurry up here. We've got good protection. Okay, so if you look at Spencer here, this is kind of what I talk about. So there's, there's a three-yard separation here. So he can set his feet. He has a three-yard separation, so now he has vision. So he can see, he can play. People say, well, you know, he didn't play good in certain games. Well, he didn't have this opportunity. When he gets this opportunity, he's pretty good. Okay, so he sees everything set, and he can make that throw. Right, It's perfect, right? You can't throw a better ball. He sees the matchup, so we'll use the NFL term. He's got a little fast guy versus more of a a heavier run player. And so he sees that. He knows he's got a good matchup, and he takes it. And the ball is thrown perfectly. Yeah, I mean, he's he's throwing a vertical route. It's a a perfect throw. He can see it from the end. Uh, We're going on to another play here. Yes. Okay, so we work on this a lot, all right? So his read's on the left. But they ended up with what we call three over two. So football is a numbers game. Mm-hmm. We have two eligible receivers, okay? I know that's 17. That might be 19. I'm not sure who that is. I believe is. it is, yes. Okay. So we have two guys that can catch a pass. But if you watch what the defense does, now they have how many playing those two? One. Or I'm sorry. We'll go one, two, and a half. So they have two and a half on our two. So by numbers, unless something unusual happens, it's not a good football play over there. Sure. So now he scans across, okay, 
he's got this guy, there's a robber here in the middle. Fortunately, he saw the robber. Sometimes they don't see the robber. If this guy would have been standing here, this guy in the stripes, accidentally standing here, the quarterback sometimes will throw it right to the guy and everybody watching the game says, how can he do that? Because he never saw him. If he would be standing just right here, it's not easy to be this guy with all these big guys chasing you and, and see everything going on. So a lot of times these guys get hidden based on where he's at. Fortunately, he saw that. So then he comes to a second guy that's in the back of the end zone and they're taught to throw the ball up high, let those guys go up and catch it at the highest point. And that's what we do. We it's perfect execution. We, we work on this all the time. And then I'll go back to the last thing is this, okay? He's got some cushion here, right? They're collapsing on him a little bit, but he, he can set his feet and he's got a little bit of cushion so he can see. It's very important. And I would wager that throw in particular where you've got to get it up over that robber. That's right. You've got to have your feet set. You try to make that throw off balance. Very difficult. comes up short. It's too low. A lot of bad things can happen. And the field's short, shrunk because you're down near the goal line, so you have less space, right? Yeah, and what happens is when you're moving your feet, you have a subconscious um, um, vision of what's going on. So then I, don't, I might not see a robber. Yeah. It's because I'm wondering why I have to move. Gotcha. Let's take a look at this. Okay, so we're down, uh, we're down to, uh, seven now. Again, just watch. So we have decent protection. His feet are set. He's sliding up. These guys are protecting better. We're starting to get an advantage because now they're getting a little bit fatigued. So we're starting to get a little bit of advantage in protection. Okay, quarterback gets an opportunity to scramble straight ahead. Just a second ago, we talked about Tyler Lacey being in, in essentially one of these two positions where he was staying back a little bit mm -hmm. in case this guy were to squeeze through here and take off. And this is what, what I'm talking about. Spencer on his way to a huge day. And, and right. that's probably the difference in personnel in terms of agility. Right. Next thing you know, and of course, if Spencer gets loose like that, for any team – Oklahoma State's playing, it's trouble. Right, so everybody's covered up, it's covered up, covered up. So you think you can throw to here, you can't. If, if he lets go of this ball, it's 5, 10, 15, 20 yards at least it has to be thrown because you've got to lead him, right? Mm -hmm. And then he only has to take seven yards to intercept it. So people say he's wide open, he's not wide open. By the time he can let go of the ball and it travels 20 yards, that guy just has to take three steps. It's not gonna work. So that's what the, you know, the difficult part of being a quarterback is all that's going on while you get about two and a half seconds to make a decision. <clears throat> is there sort of a clock or an alarm that goes off in his head pretty quick that tells him, okay, I need to take off and go? I mean, I assume that there is. Yeah, so it's, when, you know, in uh, fifth grade, they taught you, they taught me the biological clock. You have a biological clock in your brain. Mm -hmm. So when you get old like me, I wake up every morning. I don't really need an alarm clock. You just get up. I have a biological yep. clock that goes on in my brain. Quarterbacks have a biological clock that's going on in their brain. They can feel things around them so they know when to squeeze out and when not to. Easy enough. So here's a, uh, here's a play. We catch them in man coverage here. And um, when they're in man, uh, this guy should be covering this guy, three on three, number two on number two, and this guy's covering this guy. This guy's going to run out like he's running a route and then he's going to go block the guy that's covering him. Um, he, took, he took the first threat, which is the inside guy right there. This guy's getting caught standing around. He did a, made a great decision by blocking that guy instead of that guy because they passed it off. When this guy went inside, he said, you got him, I got him. This guy made an unbelievable decision to go take the first threat, and then we walk in the end zone. <clears throat> now we have a tie game. So what makes that a legal play and not offensive pass interference? Right, great question. So they're blocking downfield, but the ball's caught on the line of scrimmage or behind. So he caught the ball on the line of scrimmage or behind, which allows him to block downfield. There you go, because I'm sure someone would want to know that. Now let's look at some more defense. Okay, so they're, they're, uh, um, they're in, in kind of a double wing run to pole play, uh, an old school pole play, and uh, guys fit up. Devin Harper gets over the top of the block. And then um, safety, uh, JT comes down and fits right off his butt where he's supposed to fit. So you have a guy in this gap, 42's in his gap, uh, 90, I think that's uh, 99 is Sione. in his gap. Yep. 
Um, he's in his outside gap. Uh, Harper got in his gap. Here comes him filling this gap, and all gaps are closed. That's defensive football. I was going to say, have, that's ideal defensive football, isn't it? Got to have somebody in every gap. So if, if, if you don't have somebody in a gap, then that's where they spring free and get a chance for a big play. Right. Oh, look here. Yep. You see us do this in practice all the time, right? Yes, I do. Okay, so first guy wraps and secures the tackle. Second guy comes in. He's wrapped and secured. I don't need you to do anything other than try to take the ball. That's all you're trying to do. And he does exactly the way the way, he does exactly what we've coached him to do. And it's taught two hands. Rip. Rip it away. Yep. I want. In fact, I'll probably show that to the team today. Good. Very good. Yeah, Colby Harbell peel ends big up. Big time with game it. changer right there, right? Oh, no doubt. Huge. See, some people will say, okay, like right here where Harper's at, okay, you missed a tackle. Well, he didn't really miss a tackle. He's in his gap. He's between these two guys. That's his gap. Mm -hmm. So he goes in his gap, forces him to cut back into his gap. So it's not his responsibility to get out of his gap to make a play. It's his responsibility to get in his gap and make a play if that guy comes in his gap. And that's why over the years I've heard defensive coordinators talk about trust. Mm -hmm. If you don't trust and you try to make somebody else's play for them is when disaster occurs. I've heard that so many times over the years. And you see this here and you see exactly how everything is in sync. Everybody taking care of their gaps. Nobody trying to take care of somebody else's job. I mean, that's, that's how it seems to work. And then you see this. Yep. Yeah, it's a big play in the game. Huge play. Malcolm probably on the interception. So, yeah. So here's experience, and here's you know here's why he's I don't know he might start for the to the Lions. I'm I'm not sure, but he's going to definitely be playing in the games. If you watch him here, he sees vision. But then watch right here. He just he watch him look at look to the left. See his eyes starting to go to the left right there. So he knows where that guy's at. And what he would tell you would be my guess is, is based on this alignment, this, this formation they were in, that the, the, the width of the split of this receiver, instead of him being way out there or way in tight where he's lined up, he knows that um, when he went vertical past him, he knows he's probably running some type of an in route. And so he undercuts it. And if you watch him right here, we'll do it slow, watch him undercut the throw because he's seen it enough. So if you watch him when he's backing up, he sees this, then he automatically turns and goes this way. He doesn't go that way because he knows. He studied tape and he understands and, and that kind of cinched the game really at that point because uh, there was enough time, obviously with 640 and they were driving. This gave us a chance to get the ball and, and we were able to get a first down or two and make them use the clock and then punt. Um, but that's his experience and, and what he brings to the table. So is the quarterback for Notre Dame going back to the sideline thinking, where in the heck did that guy come yeah. from? He wasn't even supposed to be there. Is that, is that, right. I'm assuming that's what sure. happened. Sure. Because now he, he, this guy was in great position, and he would have knocked – I think he could have knocked it away, but he was willing to take that chance to throw that ball there. You see it all the time. But he wasn't anticipating Malcolm running underneath that, that ball, I can tell you that. You know, when you have a defense that's played together as long as that group did, mm -hmm. you, you, see, you see things like this, don't you? Okay, onside then, kick. In the game, you, know, you have your onside kick. And you know what's funny about this is um, this is a really good kick because this ball is going to go 10 yards, and it's got the double bounce, which is legal. And, if, you know, if you look at it, see, if he doesn't grab this ball, this guy's getting it, or maybe him. And it was a, it was a perfect kick. So we were uh, on the, the two days before the game, we were practicing over at the high school <clears throat> in Phoenix. And we practice this, you know, we line up in this, we do it every Thursday, you know, two days before a game. And we kick a ball, we kick this, and ironically that kick went right to 25, number 25. And I was over there at practice, they kicked it, our, our scout team kicked it right to him. And I said, well, that was the worst thing they can do is kick it to you because he thrives in these situations. Oh, he returned one and for Texas against Texas so Tech I'm for a standing, touchdown. I'm, I'm standing on about the 50 okay. back, and 
when they kicked it, and, and he goes up and one hands it, and I laughed to myself because I said, we just said the absolute worst thing you can do is kick it to him. And, and that's did. exactly what happened. Watch this one hand. Would there be any instance where you would have a player in that situation fair catch it? Is that well, an option? Well, he, the, if you get it on the one hop. Okay. Right? So right. see, right, you'd have to go get it right there. Gotcha. And okay. you would have to go running way up here. And that's risky, isn't it? It is. And that's why it's a perfect kick because they got the high hop on the second kick, on the mm-hmm. second one. That's pretty rare. So, so anyway, it was uh, celebration time then. Yeah, it certainly was. Here's another look. High angle. Looked like he's grabbing a rebound, like a basketball yeah. player. Yep. And that is that. It sure is. Coach, that was fun. Great win sure over was. Notre Dame. Looking forward to a lot of fun plays to look at this year. Yeah. We'll, we'll tear into them. Hope you enjoyed it. Coach Gundy and I back next week, and we'll have more for you then. Thanks for watching. <laughs>